anytime you've got characters that have abilities, you always want to, as a DM, give them, you know, reward those choices. Give them things that are going to allow them to use those abilities, as well as put up countermeasures to target those that have those abilities. I'm Nerdarchist Ted. And I'm Nerdarchist Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Nerdarchy. Nerdarchy. For nerds, by, by nerds. nerds. All right, so what are we talking about today, Dave? All right, today we're going to be talking about why does your DM hate fun, also known as flying characters, in Dungeons and Dragons. All right, so, you know, even though this applies to Dungeons and Dragons, I think it could really apply to any fantasy role playing game. Yeah, I guess, I guess it would apply to pretty much any of them. I'm trying to think, like, well, some of them might be geared better towards it, but sure. fa fantasy, I don't know. I don't play a lot of other fantasy. Like we, and also, I, don't, I haven't seen it come up much. So, like, and I don't know. They, maybe they have the same problem in Pathfinder, Shadow of the Demon Lords, another fantasy game. I haven't really seen that. Morkborg definitely not going to be <laughs> not, not a problem. <laughs> uh, but Five E has really made it more of a problem, and it's kind of ratcheted up recently. Absolutely. So I know when the Arakokra, you know, hit the scene, yeah. there was a big debate about, you know, how can I allow a flying race into my fifth edition game and like huge debate and here we are you know quite a ways after the Aarakocca release we now have several flying races in the game and it's still a hot button topic yeah so uh, I guess it was like Princesses of Pal uh, Apocalypse that free uh, download you could get you know released the Aarakocca the first time uh, Sword Coast Adventures then had the Winged Tiefling, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I think is easily overlooked and forget. But that you know that's definitely another one. Then we got uh, Sh not Strixhaven, but the, what was the other one? Witchlight, uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Yep, gave us Fairy, and then we then we got um, Strixhaven, which. You know, I forgot it as soon as I mentioned it, of course, uh, gave us the Allen. So that is four flying races. That's like almost a party of flying races without any overlap. But so, you know, let's let's break it down. So what are the issues that that DMs have with flight? All right. So the biggest problem I think DMs have with flying characters in their campaign, especially I think more than more than anything we're talking about, like from first level on, let's face it, after you hit about fifth level in the game, Pretty much, a lot of your casters are going to have access to, uh, you know, some kind of flying. They don't have it all the time, but it is there. They don't. They don't want the players to overcome their obstacles too easily, and that and that gives their panties in a bunch. All right. So before we address this question, this problem, and possible solutions, uh, if you happen to like this video as well as all the awesome content over on Nerdarchy.com, why not come check us out over on Patreon and. Support us there. Like the article, winging it, playing D and D on the fly. Not quite the wings we're talking about in this video, but close enough. But it's all all great content you can tap into over there. With that, let's take a look at you know um, flying. You know these problems. You know what are they? How do we overcome them? And it you know is there a fix? All right. So there's plenty of things that can be done. And the first and foremost is what I know a lot of DMs have done that have a problem with it. And that's like, nope, I'm just not allowing flying characters in my game. You know, you can play an Alan or an Arakokra and maybe I'll give you something besides flying or just no, those races are off limits in my game. Yeah, and there, I mean, there's reasons for doing that. Maybe you're an inexperienced dungeon master and you don't want to have to deal with the attic stress of now figuring out what to do with those things. Maybe those races just don't make sense in in your game or maybe you're just a mean DM and hate fun. I don't know. I, I, and honestly, I mean that tongue in cheek. You know, all are valid reasons. You know, if you're the dungeon master and you want to limit things in your game, you can absolutely do that. If, but you should do it in the beginning, let the players know, because maybe they don't want to play in your game with your limitations, and they might find another table to play in. Or, you know, they have a really great character idea, and they become demoralized because what they want to play is not a viable option in your game, and now they're having to go with their second or third choice, and, and that's got to, you know, that, that can have problems. So the next option up, you know, that, that that's there is as a DM, you can properly plan for having situations come up in your games that really incorporate the flying aspect of the characters that are in the game you're running. 
one one of those ways is just incorporating problems that only the flying character can overcome, right? Like making it more interesting. Adversaries that maybe they have to fight and chase down in the air. Uh, you know, maybe you know there's only oh something that can be gotten to via a flying character. So instead of like instead of this being a problem in your game, you know, it becomes this opportunity for that particular character to kind of shine. You know, for instance, there's a chasm or a gorge that you have to get across, and the bridge to activate, or the the switch to activate the bridge, is literally on the other side. And the you know the 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 bad guys are like, ha ha, you'll never be able to get across. And really, all you all you have to do is get your flyer to fly over, hit the button, the bridge comes over, and voila! Now everyone can continue pursuit. Totally awesome. Another thing, you could be in a room that has a a higher chamber that. Perhaps you need to activate two switches at the same time, and one is really up above. It could be a really hard climb, or the one dude just flies up and says, three, two, one, and you poke the button, yeah. and you know, you're able to solve the problem that way. This really allows the flying character to feel like the, the choice that they made as a player is being rewarded and incorporated within the story. I mean, and also too, like maybe maybe you do something where you do a one-off adventure or a session, which gives all the players wings, right? And it's an adventure where they can feel they can all feel like the flying character and feel special. Uh, you know, maybe it's an honorary thing they can receive for helping the Allen people or the Ara Croker people, and it's like a temporary boon or something. Or maybe you can have fun with. Or maybe you're doing something that is like a gateway, you know, in or near the elemental plane of air, so everyone has become lighter and you don't actually give them wings but you give them flight powered by air so again the other thing is countermeasures that you can plan uh bolos nets archers and flying enemies can all give your give your flying character a hard time matter of fact uh if they're up flying by themselves it, it makes them more of a target and also it may put them in more danger you know bolos that are gonna you know grapple and ensnare your wings or nets all of which could create a huge problem especially at lower levels when, you know, the character doesn't have as many hit points. So falling could be a huge detriment. Absolutely. And, th and those things, you know, are, are easy to use. I mean, when you're up in the air, unless you've got trees around, you're pretty much in the open. There is no cover. There is no advantage. Everybody's going to have an easier time seeing you. You can't really stealth in the air, you know, all, all that well. Like, you can do it soundlessly, but you can't block visuals if there are no obstacles. Right, unless you're so high up the clouds are providing cover. At that point, at that point you're effectively out of the fight anyway. Indeed. Unless maybe you're maybe you're an, uh, you're an eagle barbarian at sixth level when you can see for a mile perfectly. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, that becomes, you know, kind of a, a crazy, crazy deal. Uh, and your barbarian, why aren't you in melee combat anyway? Uh, but, you know, so th these are some of the aspects for, number one, rewarding and targeting at the same time. Is you, can, you can have it both ways and feel like it's, it's not a punishment. It's a, well, it's an aspect of the real world. If the player does something that they become obvious that... What, what is pursuing them has wings, then they might have countermeasures to, to deal with it. Well, and then also a really obvious countermeasure is just spell casting, right? Like, this doesn't even have to be particularly special because there are a lot of low-level spells that are good whether your opponent is flying or not, but they're extra detrimental to a flying character. All right, so there's some really great spells. First level, you've got sleep. Super easy thing, a low level spell. Any caster really is gonna, gonna be able to have access to it. Uh, it. It gets them out of the air because if, if you manage to roll those hit points, they're gonna fall to, the, fall to the ground. Yeah, it's gonna wake them up, but you get them grounded. Hold person, second level, another low level spell that's completely uh, useful uh, is gonna get them grounded and they're not gonna get out of it until they pass that saving throw. Hypnotic Pattern is a third level spell. It's gonna work basically like sleep in the sense that they're gonna, you know, if they fall, they're gonna fall prey, if they fall prey to it, failing their saving throw, they're gonna fall from the sky. It's not gonna affect them anymore, but it did what you needed to do, which was get them out of out of the air. Unlike Hold Person, which once you're down, you're gonna keep making those saves. And also you're gonna be prone. It's just gonna be ugly. Oh, yeah. uh, Tasha's Hideous Laughter is another one that is going to knock you out of the sky. 
And also, it's going to be ongoing. It's only a first level spell until you pass a saving throw. It'll be a little bit easier because you took some damage, but still, again, it does what it needed to do, which was knock the bird man out of the sky. Indeed. So another thing you can do when you're looking at planning for flying characters, you know, is some DM countermeasures. Confined spaces. You know, you put them in a you know ten foot or a five foot corridor. There's no height. You can't really get off the ground. You don't have you know space to unfurl your wings and flap. So no, you're not gonna fly unless you are legitimately casting the flying spell, which just gives you a fly speed. And they're like, oh, I can just hover. Without with, with with wings, you need to flap them in order to get off the ground. Yeah, I mean, even you know, even if there is. Uh, headroom right like it's five like a like yeah like a canyon even right where it's only five foot wide but it's very tall i still don't think there's an, even if you turn sideways i don't i still don't think you can fly right. right so it becomes problematic and you can be extra annoying as a dm to show the players how annoying they are and use like sturges and bats and little tiny flying creatures that won't be affected because there is enough room for them to fly around right. and do their thing but not enough for your wing characters to do theirs. Obviously, you're not going to do this stuff all the time, but you know what? Narrow spaces just happen in in dungeons and D&D games anyway. I mean, it is called Dungeons and Dragons after all, and there are going to be lots of dungeons that are made by smaller creatures, things that have burrowed or things that only can, you know, make enough space for their race to kind of carve their way through. So if you're in a kobold warren or a goblin tunnel, you know, you could have serious problems for medium-sized characters, let alone medium-sized characters with a, you know, six, eight-foot wing wingspan. Yeah, although I will say if you have, like, uh, like a cavern scene almost, uh, like, I mean, there's plenty of movies where you have dog fights and stuff. That might be fun to do from time to time where you're, where you're a winged person. There is enough room to maneuver. But, like, you know, there's obstacles. They may have to pull their wings at, in the times, making, you know, athletics or acrobatic checks in order to not slam into something. And, you know, maybe, like, there's narrow gaps that they can kind of, like, shoot through and then unfurl their wings. Uh, and then you can, like, have other flying critters that are kind of, like, they're... It's like a dogfight. It might be fun to mess with that. Absolutely. Now, I know Dave has already said this, so I want, but I want to reiterate, is this is not a, you know, let, let's hate on flying, uh, you know, any anytime you've got characters that have abilities, you always want to, as a DM, give them, you know, reward those choices. Give them things that are going to allow them to use those abilities, as well as put up countermeasures to target those that have those abilities. You know, there there wouldn't be a counterspell in the game if there weren't other spellcasters. So casting counterspell is not like, oh, you played a spellcaster, so I'm just trying to say screw you, or you're playing a flying character, and I'm going to shove you in a dungeon. So you want to have abilities and encounters and, and problems that encompass everything within the party so that you can reward those choices and at the same time challenge those choices as well. Yeah, make it an inter interesting part of the game. So lastly, the last thing we're going to look at the way to deal with flying characters in your game, and I think this is probably the way me and Ted do it, is you don't. We just play the game we normally play, and there's flying characters in that game, and we we kind of adjust as we, as we normally would for any character in the game. You know, we don't. I don't know that we're going to necessarily plan countermeasures as much as you know look for opportunities to use them just because the situation is different. Yeah, you take, you know, just kind of what I just, you know, was, was looking at is you take into account what the party is and you reward those choices and you make challenging encounters related to those choices. I think you can have an absolute blast with characters that are having flying and like having played a flying character in, in another RPG uh, who got knocked unconscious and fell to the ground and started dying, uh, that really sucked, I have to say. Uh, and it wasn't even D&D. &D, so, you know, you can definitely, you know, feel like, oh, you know, this, this really hurt this character. But that's one of the choices that you have to, you know, live with if you choose to play that kind of character. It's like when you put the character in that has counterspell and the cleric goes to cure someone 
and you counterspell their cure spell. Like, you didn't plan that, but the opportunity arose, and it's like, how can I show my players that this villain is really an a-hole? I know, I'm going to counterspell their cure spell, which is one of the one of the nastiest things you can do. It's not even like it's not even like the most powerful thing you can do, but it just really it just really gets to the players and hits them like where it hurts emotionally, I feel like. Uh, now, I will say the, the other thing, too, is like if you happen to, you know, you happen to have spellcasters and you're looking at this and I'm like, oh, hold person. Well, I can cast this on the Raging Barbarian or I can cast it on the Aarakrokra because that'll be kind of funny, you know, <laughs> or you're, you know, or when you're targeting your sleep spell, you might be like, mm, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go with that flying character first because, you know, tactically, sometimes it just makes sense, too, because, you know, you're kind of going to get more bang for your buck with doing those particular things. You're going to be like, oh, well, you know what, I may incapacitate someone temporarily, or I can incapacitate them temporarily, do damage to them, leave them prone, and also you know, now my allies can get to them. You know, so it's not really it's not really about you're not targeting the player, but you may be targeting the character because the opportunity arose and you know they gave you that opportunity by making those choices. Indeed. You you as the player, uh, you know, even a DM as a player at the table, you as the DM have have the ability to say, like, well, what is this character in this moment going to do? And sometimes, you know, it can be viewed, well, that's a dick move or that, that's a, you know, that's a jerk move. You know, th that's OK. Bad guys are allowed to be jerks. Bad guys are it's their job, right? It's in the description. <laughs> Bad guys are allowed to do things that piss off your players as long as you're not being like vindictive and malicious as the DM, like it's just well, this is yeah. what that character would do in this situation. My my intelligent foes always target spellcasters first, preferring uh, clerics and healers above others because oh, that guy keeps getting them back up and making them better. We need to shut that down. Uh, where my monstrous, bestial, animal intelligent creatures, they generally just attack the last thing that hurt them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was definitely a time where uh, you know Dave was playing a Mike and Id Lich and you know uh, my cleric was hurting him you know quite a lot with his radiant magic. Uh, you were and, stopping him from regenerating as well. Oh, well that, that's, that really annoyed him. <laughs> you know, uh, so he literally, you know, dropped me with something and then totally just boot stomped my face, <laughs> giving me two failed death saves. I was like, so it absolutely can happen. You know, it does happen, uh, you know, and it's all a chance that you have to take. But if you're looking to take some more chances, Taking Chances is a collection of games of skill and chance for 5th edition. Inside, you'll find new and different games for both characters and players to engage with, using their in-game skills and proficiencies for some, and relying on the luck of the dice for others. Along with the games, there are establishments where characters can discover and play them. The largest of these, Union Salon, introduces several new toolkits and even more games giving characters a chance to use their tools in arena-style battles, as well as to investigate a mystery. Included are eight new games of skills and chance, four establishments, over a dozen unique items, five new tool sets, an adventure focused on using tools, and a new playable race, the Dwelf. So let us know what you think about using flying characters in your game. Do you allow them? Do you do not allow them? How do you handle it in your game? Do you have a fun story you want to tell and share with the rest of the Nerdarchy community down in the comments below? While you're down there, don't forget to do all those fun things like like, share, subscribe, even go ahead and click on that notification bell. You know the drill. Quick reminder, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we drop new videos here on the channel, so come on back. But you can't wait till then, no worries, we've got you covered. Here's a video we did way back when, when the Elemental Evil Companion Player's Guide came out about the Eric Kroger. Croker, do you fear the Birdman? So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.